Okay, now to get to 1 John. You ready? All right, let's get to 1 John. This is an incredible thing. We've been working through this beautiful little book written by uh, the seasoned apostle John. And this weekend, we're talking about the test and the triumph. You know, last week, Pastor Rod's message, he, he mentioned quite a few things that were really powerful. But one of the things he said from last week that I'd written down in my notes is that love is a decision of the will. And uh, when he said that, that's one of those things you're like, I wish he hadn't have said that. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather not know that. But it's the truth, right? Is that love is a decision of the will. And we saw that last week. This weekend, we get into, it, John pivots just a little bit. And, and we get into this idea of a test and a triumph. A test and a triumph. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We ask that you open our hearts to receive the word of God. As we've worshipped, we've come to your table, we have fellowshiped, and now, oh, Father, prepare our hearts to receive the living, dynamic Word of God. May it be planted deep within our spirit, watered by the Holy Spirit, and may it bring forth fruit that brings you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Amen. I'm reading in 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, reading out of the ESV version. John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard it was coming and is now in the world. So what's the test? The test is this idea that the test has to do with the confession of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know about you, when I hear the word test, I break out in a cold sweat. I wasn't much of a test taker back in the day, and that was my dad. I found out years later what he meant by that. He meant like, son, you're just not very smart. <laughs> so when I hear test, I hear, oh, wait a minute. I, I'm not sure what to do with that word. Some of you in the room will, will remember this test. This is a test. For the next 60 seconds, this station will conduct a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Have you had enough? Me too. You get it, right? You remember that. How many of you remember those tests? Yeah, they're just super, I mean, you, I remember that noise. You know, even though testing may do something visceral within us, right? We may respond, we're like, I'm not ready, I get nervous. They're quite necessary. And in the text, the test is actually we as believers get to administer the test. Now that's exciting. It's better than taking it, I'd rather administer the test. The test has to do with the idea of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Now, the incarnation of Christ is this. It is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became, became human without giving up his deity. Jesus was not superhuman, as we often think he is. He was actually fully human. He's not superhuman. He's not Clark Kent going into a phone booth. He's fully human. He laughed, he cried, he grieved, he was hungry, he got angry. He felt all of the things that we feel as humans. But the heresy that's breaking out, the Antichrist, the false prophets, this docetic heresy from the Greek word dokine means to seem. They were saying, wait a minute, now Jesus only seemed to have a human body. A little bit like a, a ghostly figure, if you will. So that's what John's up against. That's, that's what he's writing against in these first three verses. So if you think that doceticism is this idea of Jesus only seemed to be real, that actually undermines the foundational truths of the gospel. It undermines everything that Christ was about. If Jesus were not human, there's no death, there's no burial, there's no resurrection, there's no salvation. There's no forgiveness of sins. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we are still in our sins and our faith is futile. John 1, 14. 
The author John says this, and the word became flesh. Say that with me. And the word became flesh. The Greek word sarx, right? Means actually means flesh. You're like, what's the Greek word mean? Flesh. The word became flesh. Notice what he says. And he dwelt among us. I love the way Eugene Peterson says this. He says he moved into the neighborhood. The word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. This idea of the incarnation began to kind of take on its own life. And, and, and theologians begin to develop this idea of the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is this, that Jesus Christ took on a human nature, yet remained fully God at the same time. This is serious business. In fact, I, it's hard to talk about because I'm afraid I might accidentally say something that would not be totally correct. What a person believes about Jesus is the most important thought in a person's life. And the hypostatic union, literally for thousands of years, theologians have tried to figure this out. What is the hypostatic union? How does it work? How can Jesus be fully God and fully man at the same time? In 451 AD, the Council of Chalcedon said in the person of Jesus, there are two natures, divinity and humanity, which are in complete unity without mixture, change, division, or separation. And John is writing against Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, false teachers saying, no, 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 Jesus only seemed to be real. Why is that? Because the Gnostics believe that, that matter is what? It is evil. If matter is evil... God would never house himself in the flesh. And in 1 John chapter 1, John begins this little book with these words. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and we have touched with our own hands concerning the word of life, referencing Jesus. John begins, you see how he begins his little book? Look, look at what he says. Look at these incredible words. That which was from the beginning, right? We've heard, we've seen, we've looked, we've touched with our own hands. Do you see what he's writing against? A docetic idea that Jesus only seemed to be real. What you saw on the cross, that, that was not Jesus. It was a ghostly figure. Wow. It isn't easy to get your head around this concept. It isn't for me. It's a difficult thing that for years and years and years, uh, theologians have wrestled with and tried to figure out how in the world can, can Jesus be fully God and fully human at the same time? And John is coming against that and saying, wait a second, we saw him, we looked upon him, we touched him. Uh, let's think about it this way. Suppose that I went next Sunday to a weekend weatherman gathering. I love the weather. I'd love to watch the weather. Anybody else in the house need help? We're going to get a small group around weather watching. Let's suppose I, I love to watch the weather. And let's suppose at that gathering, there was a person who stands up and says something along the lines of this. Al Roker is not a real man. He only seemed to be real. Really? Let's say that many people in the room had never seen Al Roker. They don't know who Al Roker is. I hope some of you know. If, this not, if you don't know who he is, I, let me just stop right now. <laughs> we'll save some time. And those in the room like, yeah, we know Al Roker. We see him on TV from time to time. They're like, no, no, no. The gentleman says, no, no. That's an AI generated Al Roker. He only seems to be real. There is no Al Roker. And I'm attending that gathering. The weather person gathering. And I stand up and I say, now, wait a minute. I want you to know. I want you to know. I've seen Al Roker with my own eyes. <gasps> really? At the end of May of 2014, I saw Al Roker. On top of that, I not only saw Al Roker, but I shook his hand. And I squeezed a little too hard, I'll be honest with you. 
My wife and I, my daughter, we went to the Today Show because Tim McGraw was singing, so I'm up at 1 a.m. in the morning catching a subway <laughs> from Brooklyn to the Today Show. I didn't even know what day it was. I'm taking the picture, of course. Here we are, bright and early. And man, I saw Al Roker out mingling with the people. I had the opportunity to shake his hand. This is what John is saying about Jesus. I, I, I saw him. I walked with him. I touched him. Pre-crucifixion, post-crucifixion. This is what John is writing against this idea. Like he only seemed to be real. Man, John is pounding the table. Jesus is fully human. He's pounding that table. Paul says it this way in the book of Colossians, chapter two, verse nine. He says, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, bodily. Paul also had this idea that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Here's the test. It's the confession of the incarnation. That's the test. So in other words, I would say this. We must beware of any person or group that denies or distorts either the divinity or the humanity of Jesus Christ. And let me say this as well. Make sure when you're in a conversation with, with somebody, you're in a local religious gathering, make sure that the Jesus they're speaking of is the Jesus of the scriptures. Every Jesus spoken about in our culture is not the Jesus of the scripture. And this is what John is coming against. This is what he's battling. And this is a part of, uh, of our mantra, too, that more and more groups today are distorting the divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ. That is called heresy. And make sure, friends, any conversation about Jesus, that you're talking about the Jesus of the scriptures Folks, there's a lot of language used in our religious circles that is really deceptive, very deceptive. That's why John's like the spirits. You're like, no, it's the person. No, no, there's a spirit in that person. It's the spirit of the Antichrist. Antichrist against Christ. Spurgeon said it this way. He says, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. A good quote. The test. It's our responsibility to administer the test if we're believers in Jesus. Fully God, fully human. By the way, fully God, not just when he came to this earth, but in eternity past, fully God. There are those that teach, oh yeah, he's a God now because he, can. no, no, no. Fully God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning. The Word there is Logos, referencing Jesus. That's the test we get to administer. Last thing. John talks about this triumph, right? Look at the triumph. I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. Focus on verse 4. Little children, you're from God. You've overcome them. Speaking of the false teachers who are embodied with the spirit of the Antichrist. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They're from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We're from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Here's the triumph. I just want to look at verse 4 as we kind of close our time together. Notice what he says. The triumph is overcoming them. Speaking about the false prophets who are coming from this element of, a, of the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirits. He's speaking of our, our reference to the false prophets. Interesting here, the Greek word overcomes the Greek word Nikaio. It's where we get our word Nike. How many of you have a pair on right now? Anybody? You wear a pair of Nikes? Greek word Nikaio. Surely somebody has a pair of Nikes. Okay. All right. Oh, I do. Look at me. Here I am. <laughs> My bad. I didn't buy him. My son, he keeps me in all the shoes. That's why I hated to see him go. <laughs> He's like, hey, dad, here's some more shoes. He brings them over, you know. <laughs> Nikaio, Nike, to conquer, to be victorious. What's interesting about this text in verse 4 is that John is using uh, the perfect, a perfect tense verb which speaks to the permanence of the victory. 
It's very nuanced, but it's very important. Perfect tense verb speaking of the permanence of this victory. Two things. I'll go quickly. Number one, once you see in the passage, God is the source of the believer's triumph. He's the source. John says, and look at what John says. He's like, you, it's emphatic. You, he's like, you. Yeah, you, that's how he's saying it. You are from God. He's saying God is the source of the believer's triumph. May we never forget that we have a divine heritage. We have a divine heritage. We lose sight of that often. He says God is the source of that triumph. Second of all, he says Jesus is the strength of the believer's triumph, right? He says, he who is in you. Isn't that powerful? Not he who is in the world. It's easy to lose sight, right? He who is in you. Notice what he says. He who is in you. Jesus is the strength of the believer's triumph. Paul talks about this in Galatians 2.20, right? I've been crucified with Christ. Notice what he says. It is no longer I who live. Say this with me out loud. But Christ who lives in me. He says this in other parts of the scripture. This is just one example. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. John 16, Jesus says this, in this world you will have tribulation. My goodness, he got that right, didn't he? I tell people all the time, if you don't believe anything else about Jesus, you have to admit he got that right. They're like, yeah, a lot of trouble out there. Jesus is very upfront about that. You will have tribulation, but notice what he says. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Same Greek word, Nikaio, triumphant, victory, victory, overcoming. Same word, same tense, perfect tense verb, permanence. Folks, it's not like we're going to lose. Permanence. As believers, we're not defined by the tribulation we go through, but by the triumph we have in Jesus Christ. Oswald Chambers has one of my favorite quotes. It's in one of my other Bibles. He said that God does not give us an overcoming life, but he gives us life as we overcome. He doesn't give us an overcoming life. He gives us life as we overcome. I want to end it with a couple tests. Are you ready? You're not going to get out of here without a test. Sorry. The first test is this. Are you in the faith? Are you in the faith? Like, pastor, is that a test? Actually, it is. Paul administers to the group at, in Corinth, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Look at what the scripture says. Examine yourselves. John mentioned it in the Lord's Supper. To see whether you're in the faith. Test means to see if something is genuine or not. Test yourselves. Examine, test. You know, when you say something twice to your child or grandchild, you're like, or you're somebody you work with, you're like, all right, are you getting this? Examine, test. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. There's the test. What's the test? Is your faith genuine? Man, two Sunday mornings ago after the first service, there was a guy who said, right just back behind Ronnie, where, right in front of, of Tom and and, and, and there was a gentleman sitting there on the aisle and, and two of our folks from Discovery Point, been here for a long time. Here, here come the man from Discovery Point. Man, he was making a beeline toward me. I'm like, uh-oh, what would I say this time? He runs up here and he's like, hey, pastor, I got this buddy back there. I just found out he, he's a buddy of mine and I, we brought him this weekend. I'm like, all right, man. He says, come back, have a chat with him. I'm like, I'd love to do that. So I make my way back there and begin chatting with this young man. Come to find out this young man used to work for the gentleman in our church and over, over the years, they, they stopped working together and kind of lost contact. But through, a, through Facebook, of all places, maybe every now and then there's some good stuff happening out there. They reconnected. And they reconnected and, and they invited this gentleman to church and he's pretty sick. So I made my way back there and we were just chatting for a moment. And man, eventually we just got down to the brass text. The gentleman told me a little bit about his testimony. He said he'd been involved in church. His dad was pretty, a pretty religious guy. And man, we were sitting there, didn't feel like we were getting anywhere. I'm like, all right, would you right now be willing to give your life to Jesus? He said, I would. And right there in the chair, we call it the Jesus chair. 
that gentleman, two Sunday mornings ago after the first service, gave his life to Jesus. Not only that, last week, he was right, he was right in the back last week. He was sitting right in the back last week. Had a Bible with him moving and leaning into the things of the Lord. It's a man who, who knew about religious things. There are few more dangerous places than churches. We get so close to the gospel. We get so close to Jesus. The scripture says, hey, you better take a close look at your spiritual life. Do you really know Jesus? That's the first test. You have to administer that test to yourself. Do I know Christ? If not, tonight at the end of the service, would you make your way to the front and say, Pastor, I've never met Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. We'll kind of walk you through that, right? What it means to, to become a follower of Jesus. So it happens. People, religious people get saved. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. And I think sometimes we are the furthest from the Lord. Those of us who have little religion. Briefly, yesterday, a buddy invited me out to the uh, Barrett Jackson car show. I didn't have a car there. I wasn't bidding on anything. Don't get crazy. <laughs> but suppose I thought this. or like, hey, man, I'm going to stick around here a couple more hours because if I do, maybe I will become a car. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, well, that's ridiculous. Do you know in churches across this world, people sit in churches thinking that by osmosis, they're going to become believers in Jesus. It's going to be a sad reality for many who think they know the Lord, but they don't. Let's not let that be our story. Second test, last test, are you living as an overcomer? 1 John 4, 4, to do this, I'm going to have to go King James Version for a moment. This is how I memorize it, right? I want to end it. If you're a believer, you got to know this verse. You are of children, little God, little, little children. And you have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let's leave with that mentality. Let's leave with that mentality. There's a test we need to be administering, right? And then there's a triumph we need to be experiencing in Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, I pray for anybody in the sound of my voice, sitting in this room, watching online, that each of us, including me, will stop, will examine, will test my relationship or lack thereof with Jesus. Father, if there's anybody that doesn't know Christ, I pray right now that they acknowledge their need for a Savior. They believe that Jesus, you are who you say you are. You came in the flesh. You died a sacrificial death. You rose from the grave with a victorious life. And you've come to forgive us of all of our sins, to set us free. So, Father, may we, by faith and repentance, say yes to you. If that's you tonight, I just invite you at the end of this message, make your way to the front of the room. Say, Pastor, I want to talk a little bit more about that. If you're a believer, I want you to leave here knowing greater is he that is in you than he that is within the world. Father, we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends.